Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1008th New Social Environment, a special conversation hosted in partnership with our friends at the Virilis Center for Art and Politics. I'm part of a series of three dialogues we'll co-host through April that will revisit Virilis Center's 2022 publication co-published with Amherst College Press, Studies into Darkness, The Perils and Promise of Freedom of Speech. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I feel such extraordinary gratitude to be your MC today for a conversation featuring Amar Kanwar and Ratanamo Singh Johal, who I'll now briefly introduce. Amar Kanwar was born in New Delhi, India, where he currently lives and works. Kanwar's work traces the legacy of globalization and decolonization, land use and border rights, environmental concerns, human rights, free expression, and sexual violence. Interwoven throughout these inquiries are disparate narrative structures which ground his philosophical investigations through hybrid installations which incorporate images, literature, poetry, and music. Kanwar creates meditative works that do not aim to represent trauma, but to find ways through it. His work has been exhibited in solo exhibitions internationally, and he's been the recipient of many awards. And our host today, Ratanamol Singh Johal, is Assistant Director of the International Program at MoMA, where he works on the Global Research Initiative, CMAP, and the Primary Documents Publication Series. He also co-chairs the museum's Contemporary Working Group, he earned a PhD in art history from Columbia University and has held fellowships at the Whitney Independent Study Program and Tate Research Center Asia. Previously, he worked as a curator, archivist, and publications editor at Koj International Artists Association in New Delhi. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ratan to get us started. Thank you so much, Chloe. And, and I must start by thanking um, the Brooklyn Rail and the Rail Center for inviting us um, to be in conversation here. Um, and of course, it's incredible to hear the number 1008 and think of the, the kind of staggering amount of programming um, and effort that goes into putting these together. So really um, huge congratulations and compliments on that. Um, I think um, since I'm, I'm hosting uh, this, this program, um, it is perhaps my duty to also um, introduce a little bit of this book project, this really incredible publication that the Wireless Center brought out in 2022, um, Studies into Darkness, The Perils and Promise of Freedom of the Freedom of Speech, um, which I'm holding is a beautiful object um, that I've been complimented and asked about on the subway many times in the last week um, as I was reading it on my trajectory through the city. Um, but really, it is the outcome of um, a, a dialogue that the Verlis Center team um, had with Amar and a number of other interlocutors, um, and which manifested in a series of seminars um, between November 2018 and September 2019, um, seven seminars um, precisely, and they were joined in partnership with other organizations here in New York, um, including Article 19, the National Coalition Against Censorship, the New York Peace Institute and Weeksville Heritage Center in, in Brooklyn. Um, I also want to, to call out the, the designers of the book, uh, Nancy Kilelo Muchiti and Julia Novich, um, who did an incredible job giving form to these many layered conversations um, and, and um, really thinking very deeply about um, visibility and invisibility about um, the ways in which um, different threads um, literally manifest themselves through the book um, and and to think about how the five chapters of the book, um, the titles of which I should just say, Arrival and Context, Anticipation, Order and Disintegration, Silence and Transformation, and finally, Indices and References towards a Curriculum on Freedom of Speech, um, how they how they come together and and really um, mediate and translate these conversations for the reader today. Um, of course, a free um, e-publication is available. The book is co-published with Amherst College Press, and um, I really encourage all of you um, to download that. And I know there's a link probably in the chat right now. So, um, with that said, um, I also want to 
to say what an immense privilege it is to be in conversation with Amar always. Um, and and really, this is an ongoing conversation that for me began in 2010 as a as a graduate student. Um, and I, I I really cherish every every moment and the generosity that Amar has always shown in in um, in taking the time to to share his practice, his perspectives, and really his very very significant um, interventions into um, thinking about many, many important questions, of some of which we'll get into today. Um, I do want to say that um, while the book and the, the seminars really looked at freedom of speech as a kind of core issue, as a conceptual framework, as a problematic, um, I, I think maybe today we will probably start from there, but, but go into many different directions. And um, the idea is also to talk about Amar's work um, and, and think about ways in which its forms um, have transformed and, and um, over the years and how he has um, he's grappled with certain very, very critical questions um, repeatedly in, in many different ways. Um, and just the last thing to flag in this very long monologue that I feel like I'm on um, is that the Peacock's Graveyard, um, Amar's newest work from 2023, which uh, premiered at the Sharjah Biennial last year, is currently on view um, at Marion Goodman Gallery in New York for those who happen to be in New York or are passing through just for another couple of days till the 24th. So um, we will share some images and certainly talk about it, but um, it, just to flag that that is something that you are able to visit if it's possible for you. Um, and with that, maybe I'll, I'll actually pass it to Amar with the, the kind of first question or the idea of a beginning um, and something that really moved me was to um, to read Amar somewhere that you talking about um, wanting to get out of a position always at the beginning of knowing, of coming from a place of saying something um, from from a, a position that that we understand what we are proceeding to unravel or discuss. Um, and in a way, the proposition both of the book, but also of, of your work um, has been to think about ways to get out of that position um, and how, how to find um, a manner of speaking um, that does not presume um, that prior knowledge. Um, so maybe that as a, as a, as a way to get you to talk to us about darkness as perhaps that space um, for you. Um, thank you, Ratan. Uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me here, Rukrin Lail and uh, Vera Liss Center. It's uh, opening question is a tough question straight away. Um, I don't know. I mean, position of not knowing. It's just that like uh, I think um, over the many years uh, of trying to work and make work and show and so on, uh, I think at various points I have felt, uh, and I remember quite uh, almost 10, 15 years back as well, um, that sometimes you don't realize where you are and you don't realize, you don't know uh, what you're not understanding. Uh, sometimes uh, you're making, thinking, talking, being uh, in a way that is uh, um, almost like automatic and uh, like you know what to do and you proceed, you know, making and working in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these things would make me feel a bit uncomfortable, I'm actually often uncomfortable with myself. Um Almost like if I was too sure, I would feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes. Um, if it became, uh, if it seemed to become too easy, I would also become uncomfortable. Um, and that was, I think, the first time that I felt that it was necessary to stop, uh, stop working, uh, stop communicating, stop, uh, you know, even thinking. Uh, for as long a period as is possible. 
And in the context of uh, this particular film and book and so on, I think uh, it's quite clear for all of us that we definitely have crossed the point of no return. You know, sometimes uh, we have argued and debated and discussed ourselves to the very end. And um, there was a need, I felt a need in some way to find a way to move forward. And uh, the way to move forward seemed to move backwards, to step back. That, that was probably the best way to move forward. Um, and uh, again, it was also difficult to, you know, at least what I felt that, you know, how do I find what is, what kind of conversation to have, you know, when we have had all the arguments, how do I relate to somebody who is speaking, uh, you know, it's one thing, it's like, how do you relate to say selective prejudice is one thing, but how do you relate to somebody who is, uh, speaking continuously from a totally different position, uh, no matter how much you converse or listen to each other or talk, uh, you don't seem to be moving forward or at least opening up uh, each other. And uh, so all of these things, I think, is quite apparent for everybody. Uh, it was also something that I was feeling, seeing the, the trajectory that Everything was moving in India, and I'm sure in the United States too, over the last 10, 15 years, maybe even more, uh, that I felt that it was necessary to uh, step back and uh, stop, step back, try to find a zone, try to find a space where one could get in to uh, and stay there for a while and uh, then see what happens. And the thing about uh, doing something like that is that very often uh, we end up becoming too figured out. Even when we are not figured out, we are figured out about not being figured out, you know. <laughs> and uh, so somehow uh, I just wanted to find a way to just uh, shut up and uh, stop and uh, not even analyze that position too much and try to see how long I could stay in that position uh, and then see what evolves from that. And I think that's where, at least what when we were talking about, when I spoke about trying to find that position of not knowing so that at least one could begin to have some kind of a conversation or even some process of listening, which is not necessarily uh, loaded and preconceived and so on. And I could talk more about it uh, as we go down what yeah. that means. Thank you. Um, I think maybe this is a good time to to bring up images of such a morning, um, the work from 2017 that I think um, you, perhaps this is the, the, the quote that I had earlier and your discussion about this moment of stepping back um, was perhaps um, in the context of a work that I see as as a sort of departure in the larger trajectory of your practice. Um, I think in a conversation some years ago that we had about this, um, you said you felt like you were doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but here, um, both in terms of um, the kind of structure of the work, the narrative form of the work, um, and even in some ways, certainly the visual language um, of the work, um, I saw something quite um, staggeringly different from from perhaps a decade of work before that. Um, and so maybe this is a, a good opportunity to sort of lay out um, a little bit more about the, the making of this work and some of those um, perhaps prompts or insights that that, that stepping back produced for you. Um, I also know for Karen um, and the Wireless Center, this was uh, an extremely important um, encounter with such a morning uh, initially at Documenta 14 and then of course it's shown elsewhere since then as well to to begin to think about this question of darkness um, as a trope, as a metaphor, um, as a space of uh, retreat, reflection, anticipation. Um, so just putting that out there for you. 
Yeah, I mean, in in hindsight, I think it's possible to be eloquent, uh, but I think uh, uh, when I began working on this film, uh, it took me a, a, a long time. It's it in some senses, it's, it's true that it is. It looks and feels different from a lot of work that I've done before. And even while making it, it was a totally different process uh, because I was dealing with supposedly fiction. I was dealing with actors and um, and so on. Uh, but uh, I think when I look back, I realize yet again, I'm making the same work again. Just making the same work in another way, but uh, doing exactly the same things and knocking on the same doors, uh, but trying to do that in in another way and in another way. And uh, because here I have uh, uh, actually retreated into uh, almost com not just retreated into silence, I've actually retreated into complete darkness. Uh, so from uh, trying to speak, uh, trying to engage, trying to argue, to to poetry, to text, to silence, to silence and darkness in a sense. So, mm -hmm. um, and all, uh, you know, in many ways, I think probably trying to deal with, uh, I don't know what, how do I say it? Our, our, sometimes it feels like our um, desire for violence, mm -hmm. how to understand that and how to, how to relate to that. Uh, sometimes it feels like our comfort with it or even ours, you know, um, there's even a celebration of it uh, and so on. And and uh, all of these things uh, seem so difficult uh, to understand, to relate to, to respond to, uh, that uh, perhaps I am continuously doing the same thing over and over again. So here, um, um, it is, uh, I, I remember when I'm, I'm, I think the only thing I remember about the beginning of it was just a huge amount of uh, self doubt. Uh, because it was quite absurd at that point what I was thinking about. And what I was thinking about was that how could I, um, uh, you know, find a way to uh, get into a zone where you can't, you know, what is it that you see? What can you see in a zone where there is complete darkness? Uh, what can you see at night? What do you see in, in, in daylight? What do you see when you can't see anything? Uh, what do you hear when you can't uh, see anything? And uh, so, and so, what was I trying to do? And I was just trying just that. I had nothing more to say mm -hmm. at the beginning, and. Uh, and that's a very little uh, kind of line to write uh, a whole work on and the next few years on. So I felt quite hesitant about doing this. And then, of course, the absurdity of um, wanting to build this train and, um, and have uh, a professor who is acclimatizing. Mm actually acclimatizing to darkness before total darkness and the descents. Uh, so, um, so to build this train, and I've never built a train before or, or, or a coach before or anything. And of course, I didn't do it all by myself, uh, but with many other people, but still. Um, so there were a lot of uh, kind of doubts at that point, and uh, they continued pretty much throughout. Uh, of the making, what I could definitely say is that, I mean, usually when you work with fiction, uh, you script uh, the entire film. Mm -hmm. And once you've scripted the entire film, you more or less try to execute that script. Uh, and But here, uh, I felt that I had, uh, I had scripted just a bit. And I wanted to begin to film and make it in real time, in the sense that I would let me see what it feels like to be in 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 darkness. Let me see what it feels like to to so actually see uh, or not see. 
and so on. So it was quite tentative, uh, writing a bit, filming a bit, writing a bit, filming a bit, editing a bit, looking at it and so on and letting it kind of nudging it, even asking, you know, what do I do? Where do I go now? Where does this story go? Mm. What does he do? Where does she come in? Mm. And so on. And so uh, nudging it ahead slowly uh, until I got into a position of actually wanting to come out of the darkness and come out of darkness uh, with a set of feelings and a set of needs and desires and communications. And I think that's uh, mm -hmm. um, broadly the you know the trajectory of this. Uh, of this story, uh, which uh, in many ways I think uh, even made itself, you know, the way it kind of, the way it carried on, the way the filming process and the story itself uh, culminated inside a film uh, of a professor going into darkness and staying inside darkness, uh, acclimatizing to darkness. And then many little things began to happen uh, to us, to me, to him, to everybody. And uh, we started to learn to uh, look at it differently. And even if the wind blew, you know, the light changed. Actually, you can't, you need a bit of light to even see darkness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there is no static light. Light keeps changing as well. Uh, and through the day, the wind keeps changing through the day. Dust changes through the day. So many things start changing and you realize soon that there are many kinds of light and many kinds of darknesses. And within then within that whole kind of spectrum, uh, it's possible for another kind of vision uh, to emerge. And uh, so I think that's, that's what this was about. Yeah. And since we have the letters on the screen and, and you, you know, the way that you describe the work sort of making itself or constantly um, not being pre-scripted, but really coming to you in, in stages. I think the letters are really um, powerful and sort of revealing um, how the work continues to make itself. And in a way, um, those insights, those um, reflections have a space to emerge in dialogue with the large single channel projection um, in the form of these um, of these sort of pithy um, formulations that that I know have been kind of accretions to the work um, since its first making as well. And, and I know letter number seven was um, really crucial for the publication with the Verlis Center, um, but there are, there are um, a number of other letters um, that have come into being um, that to me read um, very much um, in this mode of you know, that you described of um, coming to realizations in the process of making and always keeping space, um, even if that sort of large film remains in one way as is, um, these letters and these constant um, additions to the works. And perhaps we can go back and talk about some other works, but this, this has happened over time as well, this kind of chapter-like format, this iterative nature. Um, but maybe you want to say something about the letters as yeah. we have this beautiful image on the screen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for, see, for, for me, this is, a, this is actually a, real, a, a very real situation. It's, uh, it's not an abstract situation. It's a real conversation that we are, I think all of us are having all around us, uh, at home with our neighbors, on the street and everywhere. And uh, I felt it was necessary to uh, to to reconfigure, and 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 uh, but I did not know how to reconfigure and to find a way to, re to reconfigure. And so, in that sense, darkness is uh, it is a it is a space of not knowing. It's also a space where you go in to 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 find something uh, afresh and 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 another way. So when the professor uh, reaches a certain point in his uh, journey. Uh, he begins to write and he writes, you know, he writes his first letter to the chancellor of the university explaining why he left suddenly and why he cannot teach anymore and what has been his experience. And he writes that uh, during the time he was there so far, he has discovered or found uh, 49 types of darknesses, 21 within and the rest on the outside, and that he feels he needs to 
in some ways understand all of them, research, work at them, before you can even move towards some form of a curriculum or a syllabus or a way of teaching. So until, you know, uh, in, a, in, in a way he is pointing out, begins to point out, uh, you know, towards just looking at fundamentally at what he was teaching or what we are all teaching and how we are teaching and in what form we are teaching and, and of course what we are teaching. So he wanted to read configure and subsequently he writes to his colleagues and his students and children in the street and so on um, in the film he writes these four letters uh, but I uh, I wanted um, I mean it's nice to not finish a work mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that I've felt often that uh, at least for me sometimes everything I make I when it's over I take a look at it and I see what it's miss what is missing. Uh, in a sense, I relate to its its inadequacy, really, mm. uh, and uh, and try to, in some way, uh, respond to that inadequacy in, in the next thing I do. Uh, and I think that probably explains, to some extent, what you refer to about another chapter. Mm. Uh, and uh, so the professor writes his fifth letter and his sixth letter which are not in the film. So in a way, the story moves out of the film mm -hmm. and gets into another form. Uh, and uh, he writes his fifth letter to, uh, whoever, to, to other people, etc. And by the time he reaches his seventh letter, his seventh letter has a certain amount of uh, clarity. It's an invitation. And it's, a, it's an invitation that collapses time also. It invites you to a meeting or a gathering or a coming together to think uh, about a range of things in a certain way, uh, even as it describes the coming together at the same time. And, and, and I think that's, I mean, just to try and be as precise and brief as possible to your question, I think that's how the story within the film moves out, gets into this physical form, into an installation, and then mm -hmm. starts expanding. Um, and therefore, in a way, is is asking for friendships and solidarities and collaborations and further investigations uh, in another realm, uh, not just within the single screen. Hmm. Um, I mean, one of the things that really struck me was also this idea of darkness as something that defines the space of the installation. Um, and your invitation in a way to us. And obviously this is um, something that also you've played around with in different works, not all of which are necessarily black boxes, but um, to think of the black box within the space of a museum exhibition or a biennial um, where many of these works have shown um, as a kind of invitation to um, all of us to the listeners. Um, and I think in, in the seventh letter, there's a really interesting um, little bit about the role of the listeners um, to, and of course, listeners also being viewers in this case. Um, and I wondered if that is something, um, you know, that that you have, where the sort of darkness of the train car and the darkness of the room in which we view this film, where they collapse and and how, in a way, the duration and the temporality of the work um, actually really lends itself to a kind of um, slowing down, to a kind of looking that is, um, I think Such a Morning is, is an 85 minute film or something close to that. Um, and then to then also emerge from the installation from that black box and confront um, these letters, um, which which become a space to process, to reflect, um, and and to think about the how one has actually, um, you know, been caught in the same dynamic that you described of of not really being not really having the opportunity to 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 stop and understand to really try to grapple with uh the immensity of everything that is consistently happening around us all the time um i don't know if that that's something that you... yeah no i i, I mean uh I, I would 
I would say that I mean in 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 a way, uh, uh, I mean going getting out of the black box. Uh, I very often I think we are all pretty much in the same plane now. Whether you are in the Middle East or in the United States or in India, you can we can relate. We understand. We are in real time. Uh, we are experiencing many things in real time. Uh, and uh, I uh, I wanted to find a way to uh, to reach out and uh, try to understand together. Uh, and I also felt that, and it's something that I felt again and again is that it's not about comprehending something, but it was perhaps about multiple comprehensions. Uh, but in different ways, so that sometimes it's it's like if you're trying to understand something uh, and the same thing, the same space or the same set of issues or the same complexity, uh, you reach a certain kind of comprehension. And then in a little while later, you you get to the same, you, you're relating to the same issue, but with a different methodology and in a different way. Uh, essentially, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that you move from one kind of comprehension to another kind of comprehension to another kind of comprehension of pretty much the same thing. Mm. And uh, when you're able to do that, it's not necessary that you have the first comprehension and then the second comprehension and the third comprehension as much as what's probably more interesting and exciting is moving from one kind of understanding to another kind of understanding to a third kind and to the so it's the it's the transference or the shift between and very soon you kind of realize that you're 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 dealing with the same thing but uh, uh hmm. you're experiencing it and comprehending it in entirely different ways and i think that's uh also, what I've been trying to do in earlier works, as well as in this work, that mm -hmm. we we come close to this uh, out of the black box into another space, uh, uh, into another form, uh, and then, in fact, we move out of it into, uh, you know, the Vera list center, uh, yeah. and and uh, again, we are dealing exactly with more or less the same thing, but completely differently with another set of people in another terrain. Uh, so it's the same person, it's the same journey, but we are kind of mm -hmm. uh, doing it in different ways. And I think that's perhaps that may answer your question. Yes, but it, it also makes me think, Amar, and this is maybe a good time to look at images from the torn first pages, where I think that um, that sort of that installation really does um, give us a sense not just of this these kind of multiple. Um, understandings or, or comprehensions, but also of a kind of simultaneity within the space um, where, you know, if we, those three three large structures that, that house these um, really stunning projections on paper, um, firstly, as a form, I think this is something that um, uh, perhaps appeared for the first time in your practice in this work, um, to be using paper um, as a material um, on which to project fleeting images, on which to, um, you know, play out these um, these incredible um, uh, shots from different modes of your own research in in into archives, into um, significant histories of people, as well as um, of certain figures of authority, and um, and I think it's really important to to encounter an installation like this, um, which is not a black box concertedly, um, to think about how um, one can actually move through each of these chapters and and that that kind of accretion again or that simultaneity of the image in, in each of these, um, of the image and the text in each of these chapters um, sits with one um, um, really in, in a very powerful way. So um, we had the privilege of showing this work last year at MoMA in, in the Signals exhibition, and it was wonderful to have you here for that. But I think this was really um, a very crucial, in my view, 
uh, moment in the practice to really bring together something that you had done in a trilogy of films before this, a trilogy of single channel films that we can also get into. Uh, but I think the Torn First Pages, again, speaks of another kind of visual formal departure, but also this kind of conceptual coming together um, of different registers of understanding and archive. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the impulse is, <clears throat> I'm not thinking about how to show, frankly, uh, at all. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just too, uh, every time, I, as I said before, when, whenever I go I make something, even if I'm, even if I'm not making something and I'm experiencing, and if I, if you're looking at several social movements, uh, citizens, uh, groups, efforts, resistances, or any kind of thing that you, uh, or, or a larger social process, or even an organizational process, and if you if you participate in it in any form, uh, either to uh, tell its story or to be a part of it, uh, especially if you start telling the story, it there is it, immediately at least for me I have felt that uh, I don't know how to tell the story. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated. There are too many things happening. There is something that you can see. There's a lot that you can sense, but you don't know how to say. There's a back end. There's a back end of a back end. There is so much. Uh, so just the whole process of of coherence uh, itself is uh, is a also a complete process of attenuation and disregard and. Uh, lack of understanding at the same time you, uh, and you leave out you leave out so many things so if you look at say the democracy movement in Burma in Myanmar uh, it's it's uh, incredibly complicated it's it's many ethnicities it's one of the most amazing uh, uh, 40 50 years of very hard and very difficult to understand this kind of courage of the resistance. It's four or five generations of different different uh, ethnicities who are now all over the world and they're repeatedly uh, facing a kind of brutality that is unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how, how, and there are issues within, there are issues of all kinds. Uh, and there is the rural, there is the, the jungle, there is the exile, there are the cities, there's the, uh, the army, uh, there is so much. How do you tell this? How do you even begin to understand uh, whether it's the fight or whether it's the reason to fight or whether it is the way to respond or whether it's just the kind of the courage and how do you... So in, in some senses, this is something that I've felt again and again in many other situations, even when one is looking at the question of violence or even sexual violence, looking at like think testimonies, how do you tell this? I mean, there's really no way to tell this. Uh, and uh, so in trying to answer this, I'm asking people how to do this. And, uh, and of course, uh, as one moved along, I felt that I needed to somehow see what I can't, at least sense what I can't tell. So can I have blanks? Can I have gaps? Can I, can I tell a story where you can sense that there is a gap? as you can perhaps see even in this image by chance that's just come up. Mm. Uh, and or can I, uh, you know, what happens if I look at three points in time together at the same time? I mean, do I start understanding it differently? Uh, what happens if I, if I have one journey that's going backwards in time, one journey that's going forwards in time, but I can see this backward and forward together? Uh, and do I suddenly understand both these journeys in a totally different way? And uh, so how can I all mainly to get a sense of what I can't see uh, or I don't have the words or we don't have the words for so that one, maybe you don't get a full sense of it, but at least I get a ability or a, or, or a way or a, a, a method or something to get a deeper sense of mm -hmm. what it means to be in this situation uh, or to be like that, it, but differently and differently again and again in many different ways so that it gets 
deeper and deeper. And I think uh, more or less struggling with this uh, need, uh, you, I, I think I try try a method. I try I try a way where I can see, like again in just this very image, uh, it's a family and it's too you know. Uh, so, but it's and I am talking about exile and 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 uh, the memory of leaving. This is filmed in in the United States actually, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that's how I think the torn. Of course, the torn first pages and paper was uh, relating to the bookshop owner who was staring out the first page that contained statements of the military government which were dictated and had to be published. So he would tear the first page out before he sold his books. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that was a, 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 an unbelievably uh, an act of courage to do this in complete anonymity because the consequences of being caught would be very severe. So. How did he do that? And you know, uh, so that also, uh, you know, brought the whole question of finding a way to project on paper and on the torn sheets of paper that he had, which he subsequently got arrested for, uh, and uh, also uh, with different ethnic nationalities, different democracy movements within the same. I mean, Burma is not Burma. How do you even explain that? It, it actually is something else. Uh, just like perhaps United States is not United States and is something else completely. And perhaps should be or was and so on. So uh, how do you experience all of that together uh, and find a way through it? And I think that's how this came about. Uh, mm. and, and this... I mean, it makes me this question of the of acts of courage. Um, it also makes me and and the ways in which um, these resistances have have occurred um, in different places in different times um, brings me, I think, to the the question um, another question that you have have grappled with and have rearticulated in many different works and perhaps torn first pages is one of the one of the first places um that this also comes into into being is is that of of evidence and the nature of evidence and the forms of evidence um and certainly um poetry has been for you um and preceding this in, in the film a night of prophecy from 2002 um has been an archive um an evidentiary archive that you have um looked at that you have traveled widely um, to understand to explore and to document in a way um, to present and then to ask um, some very crucial questions about um, and just to quote from the current publication um, you ask is legally valid evidence adequate to understand the meaning and extent of a crime what if poetry was presented as evidence in a specific criminal or political trial not metaphorically or esoterically, but poetry formally presented as evidence in one of its multiple forms, would there be a sudden moment of comprehension? Would we then pause? Um, and I just want to bring this um, to the fore and to the room, um, also in the context of um, two recent in projects um, of the, the Peacock's Graveyard in 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 on view currently, but also um, a very important um, intervention, the issue of um, Outlook magazine, a major news magazine in India that you were invited to guest edit um, the January issue, the, the first issue of 2024. Um, and the, the issue cover, which I think we have at the very end of the slideshow, mm -hmm. is um, it's, it's titled Poetry as Evidence. Um, and I really would love for you to to share more about this with us especially as um perhaps not many people in this room have access to to this issue here but it is really um a very significant um intervention into the space of media the very very restricted space for um for free speech speaking of in india currently um 
Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, just even before I come to the magazine, which is the January issue this year, uh, very briefly to, to say that uh, it is quite clear that and not very difficult to understand that uh, it's not working, you know, in, in terms of uh, even if you're looking at justice or the question of justice. So if you, even if you look at just the court of law, um and um, and that if you if you if you if you have not one crime but many kinds of crimes continuing then uh, and i'm speaking just as a normal person not as a specialist of any kind i'm just saying that if it is continuing then you know either we want it to continue or we don't know that it is continuing or perhaps we don't uh, understand what it really means and what is its scale and its meaning and its impact what does it do to people who are within uh, say the footprint of this crime what does it do to me who is on the side of it and so on uh, maybe we don't and maybe if we did understand uh, it would uh, you know it would put an end to it but in, in many ways, uh, one of the ways in which it is to be understood and responded to is the courts of law. Mm -hmm. They have to understand, they have to respond to it. And, uh, and if they are also unable to respond to it, as is very clear e everywhere, then maybe, uh, maybe they are looking at the wrong kind of evidence. Maybe they have the wrong set of tools and the wrong methodology to understand a crime. And, and subsequently to analyze it and subsequently to uh, pronounce justice, which supposedly we all accept. So then what could this other method be? Uh, and I think trying to answer these questions again in a very normal, commonsensical manner, uh, uh, I found that, uh, and from referring to the uh, text that you read out, I found that the only way to do this is to actually try it out and see whether there's, you know, what if the definition of valid evidence and invalid evidence itself was wrong? What if this, what if, what if they got it wrong uh, of what is valid and what is invalid? And uh, so how does one answer that? And the only way you can answer that is to actually support supposedly invalid evidence next to supposedly valid evidence. And let's see what kind of understanding both these two uh, forms of evidence uh, provide. And how does it equip us to understand uh, the scale and extent, the depth, the meaning of the crime uh, on others and on ourselves? And uh, when you do that, you find that uh, poetry in, in a certain way and in its widest sense uh, and in, in its complete inadmissible, legally inadmissible way, actually allows uh, and helps us uh, to enter and understand in many different ways, in ways that we had not imagined uh, as well. And uh, coming to this magazine, I was invited to guest edit. And this is a really respected news magazine mm -hmm. <clears throat> for over 20 years. And uh, to guest edit their opening issue of this year. and. Uh, this is a pretty critical year, 2024, for everybody in many countries with reference to elections and mm -hmm. and so on. And um, so I, I kind of presented the same set of propositions that we have been discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, is there another way to understand? But actually presented it uh, to, uh, to the magazine, uh, to the journalists that uh, who have been reporting uh, continuously uh, and uh, that how could we how could they actually tell the news but it's like your newspaper you pick it up and it's not it's in verse or it's in poetry mm -hmm. it's not worse. so uh, so instead of going out to get your story uh, let's go out and find the poet uh, on your beat, on your week uh, for tomorrow morning, and see what 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 do we bring back, and and so on. So that's how this uh, uh, this magazine came about. So it 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 is essentially what it just does is that it 
it uh, it just opens up a terrain that is actually being invisibilized or removed or uh, and opens another way. Yeah. And I mean, in that process of working with the team of the magazine and working with the journalists, I mean, I was just very curious because this is not a prompt or a brief that they usually have. And um, there is a certain kind of, um, I mean, there, there is a kind of cognitive dissonance, if you will, in 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 trying to, to confront um, registers of speech that I guess in your formation as a journalist, um, you often discount or do not necessarily pay attention to um, and I think this, you know, I think it brings up a larger question, um, both the, the quote from you that um, I read out earlier, Amar, but also just of, of the kind of um, forms of speech in which we invest um, certain values and certain kinds of um, truth-telling power. Um, you know, we've moved perhaps from the, an era of testimony, to an era of forensics, uh, to an era where we're grappling with what it means to really take seriously both human and non-human agency. Um, and I think it's it's very powerful to read, um, and I've only had a chance to read some of the poems in this, but um, to see the kind of range um, of places, but also the, the really um, very deeply disturbing uh, perspectives that that are very difficult to imagine actually surfacing in in a conventional news story. Um, and so, you know, that's certainly the success of this, but it's also, I was curious in a way about the challenge of it for um, for a group of people who are used to putting together something quite different um, and, and working with methods that are very, very much maybe at odds, one could say, with um, with what you proposed. Yeah, I mean, uh, at first that I would like to say is that, you know, nothing that I'm saying uh, so far that I have and even otherwise, I am not looking, saying this from a, in a prescriptive way. Mm. I'm not saying this is the way to do it and this is the way to understand and this is, I'm just saying this is my trying to figure it out and I'm sharing that. I'm not saying you have to accept it. Uh, or agree with it uh, at all. Um, the magazine has a remarkable editor, uh, and she, Chinky Sina, and she. So, in in a sense, this I can't do this on my own. So she she is wishing to challenge the way the magazine has been conceived and imagined so far. She takes her colleagues and her senior colleagues and the management and so on, on and, and the advertising and everybody, um, you know, to take the risk of trying another way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a big battle really has been fought and won by her to, to and everybody else there. The actual experience I think is the same. Uh, uh, what you find. You find uh, people who doubt you, people who sneer at you, people who criticize you, uh, people who are waiting for you uh, with great joy and thrill and uh, people just uh, ready to take off in a direction that they haven't and a lot of enthusiasm and so on. So you find everything all the time. Uh, and uh, and the idea, at least my intention, is to to uh, to try and do it and 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 see whether it makes sense or not. Uh, all I can say is that um, you know it's like they want to reprint. Yeah. So you know which news magazine reprints an issue three months or mm -hmm. this is a weekly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, it certainly must have made some sense to them, uh, even though it is uh, um, not what they would normally do, and even though it does contain things that can put them at risk 
uh, in many ways, but uh, they have taken this decision. So I think they, they probably found some meaning in it in different ways, and so did their readers. Yeah. Um, and perhaps maybe um, we have the last few minutes, Amar, before we, we open up um, the room to questions. Um, I think to go back to the Peacock's graveyard and to speak about this um, most recent work, which also takes on certain literary forms, not necessarily poetry, but thinking about the fable, the parable, um, and both in terms of your writing in this work, but also um, the stories that you've taken or adapted, um, and then this this um, confrontation with with multiple images again um, in a very very dark room, and I. I think I've accounted this to you, but my first experience of, of the work in Sharjah on a very dark night um, and, and you know, going from that darkness to another kind of darkness of the, the space in which it was installed and really then um, having these kind of emergences, if you will, um, as the different channels um, at a very different scale, perhaps somewhat the scale of, um, of maybe large books or pages come into view. Um, and indeed, then the text that begins to appear, um, and 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 a, and a very evocative um, soundtrack, a rag that you use in this in this piece. Uh, perhaps you'd like to say a few words about it before we we open it up. Yes, thank you. I mean, I I think I came to this work from a few kind of places. Uh, and this is something that uh, I think a lot of people feel, and I had also been feeling for quite some time, uh, last several years actually, that, uh, but I didn't know how to respond to that, um, which is that uh, it's something that you encounter perhaps in the subcontinent and maybe elsewhere, or at least I have, or sometimes felt that it's about how one relates to uh, death, and in, in in fact, in this there there's there's a lot to learn. I think uh, in from relating to death in many different ways, and uh, and trying to understand it in many different ways. Uh, in some way, that actually becomes quite strength giving as well, if one is able to relate to it in a certain way. Uh, it's in the same way as like, even I, I'm not equating death with this, but I'm saying sometimes one confronts the meaning meaninglessness of one's existence, you know, and mm. you come face to face with it. Uh, and then if you can have an interesting relationship with that meaninglessness, then uh, it can be quite interesting and meaningful. And there could be many uh, lovely things to do once one is able to have this relationship with meaninglessness. Uh, and in the same way, perhaps uh, uh, also with death, um, you can understand. I, I felt that I could understand, I could respond to uh, the, the fastest turn of politics, uh, the celebration of violence around me. Uh, the annihilation of uh, certain communities and ways of thinking and thought and speaking, uh, I felt I could uh, actually relate to it in a very real contemporary way by um, relating to the question of death, uh, but from many different perspectives. Uh, the second thing was that I felt uh, I can't argue anymore. And I can't explain anymore. And I can't uh, do a lot of things that I used to do anymore. And I felt that I, uh, I probably had to just go to the beginning uh, for myself uh, and start afresh uh, and tell a story. And so I wrote a few, for the first time, short little stories uh, and try and just do it, from, say it like that. So this is a story of a priest the hangman and or the landlord and so on. Uh, these are little stories. And um, the third thing I think was that I was 
I have done this many times before, but somehow I I wanted to uh, uh, find a way in which I could tell a story that you didn't know where it was, how it was appearing. It it would not come within a single frame, and even then, within that, when your images would come uh, or your elements would come, you wouldn't know where it was coming from. Uh, and you know, with Utsav Lal's. Uh, uh, quite incredible 27-minute piece on Rag Malkons. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 in some senses, it becomes a performance uh, of images. Uh, it also breaks a certain way of seeing and waiting and expecting uh, an image and a text and a telling. So it could also be sung out, you know, you could you could tell, you could use the same set of images and tell another story and another story and another story all night. Uh, so this was just a little try uh, mm. uh, to do that and to see whether it made sense and if it works. That's what it was. Thank you, Amar, um, for sharing that. And I think I want to go back with what you just said in mind and 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 view the work one more time. Um, but I think this is maybe a good moment to turn it over back to Chloe. Um, to bring in all of you um, into the conversation as well um, and, and welcome your questions. Thank you, Ratan, and thank you, Amar, for that amazing dialogue. Um, thank you so much. We do have a few questions from the audience, um, and I'm gonna give Riel the chance to ask the first question. Riel, I'll give you the chance to unmute to ask. Um, thank you so much. I um, oh, there we are. Um, thank you so much, Amar and, and Ratan. This is such a um, incredible conversation, and to hear um, the ways that these um, different projects um, such a morning and um, and uh, Peacock's graveyard and um, the torn pages, how they all relate to each other and to these multiple articulations and. Um, applications of darkness and silence and um so my question uh, wasn't so much a, a question i guess but um in the chat um i was interested in building these connections between how you build these connections between evidence as poetry or the need for a more expansive uh, comprehension of speech and testimony and the multiple forms of darkness and silencing uh, articulated through omar's work and I'm curious to hear this related to how these multiple forms of silencing are unfolding at the current moment. Um, and um, and that I mean silencing through violence, through erasure, the erasure or the generational silences that we hold um, between ourselves or within our bodies. Uh, I mean, I would actually come uh, use your question really to come down to uh, uh, when I when I first met Karen after showing such a morning in when she saw it I think for the first time and uh, and she uh, and there were others with her and uh, they asked uh, she asked uh, you know what is um, what are the darknesses and uh, and uh, of course, I was waiting for somebody to ask me that, and and I said, "Shall we figure it out together? Mm. And can we do that together? And would you like to do that together?" And I and, and I think it's important to kind of mention that uh, I, I I don't I I didn't even for one second think that uh, she would come back and that the Verilis Center would come back and say, "Okay, fine, let's do it." Uh, let's figure it out together. And um, so, uh, of course, I said, uh, I felt that let's, you know, let's begin from a position of not knowing. Uh, let's, uh, um, you know, find a way and let's find a way to share it also. When, wherever we reach at the end of it, let's find a way to share it. And that's the book uh, that we have ended up with. Uh, mm -hmm. But in between that journey is a journey that the Verilis Center uh, actually quite incredibly did, and you can read about it. But um, 
when it did that, uh, and of course, I uh, uh, they chose uh, for, and I said, you know, what would be the zone of darkness, which is not necessarily in, uh, a, you know, a bad thing, uh, just a zone that you feel is necessary for you to urgently uh, enter and understand. Uh, and uh, and she said, and they said that it is uh, speech. And, uh, and of course, then the question of freedom of speech. Uh, for me, uh, it was a, a freedom of speech, yes, as an issue, uh, necessary. But for me, even speech itself was a zone of darkness. Mm. Uh, just, uh, and, and subsequently, I mean, the moment you make speech the zone of darkness, a, a lot of my work has been about uh, multiple kinds of the, of silence. And how do you, how do you sense this? And, you know, even, uh, even ways to describe these silences. But uh, during the course of these discussions at the Vera List Center with many other people, uh, it very clearly, it was very clear that there are many people who are, uh, who have not spoken at all, ever. So the, we, you know, even before we discuss the question of freedom of speech, we probably need to see who has not spoken. And even those who have um, can speak, uh, they can't speak this language. It is the language itself is, is, is not, uh, is toxic and not right. And there is no way to even enter the space of, uh, of, of, of speech and so on. So, Actually, the the whole process, uh, you know, uh, of course, opened us up to even accepting speech that we find difficult to uh, listen to, and uh, and and so on. So I'm not directly answering your question, but I think that uh, this is a continuous process. Uh, you have a lot of understanding and knowledge that actually exists in the world which has never been written. They're, they are in languages that don't have a script. So it's not there to see and, and print and, 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 and so on. How do you sense that knowledge and that wisdom which is not scripted? Uh, and at the same time, uh, I mean, what is happening in this country, I think, is a long story now. Uh, the kind of silencing that is taking place and has been taking place, and also the uh, it's not it's not a chance thing. It's very clear and apparent that this is a project. It is being executed. You can see the manner and method in which it is being executed. Uh, looking at many institutions uh, of a democracy. Uh, so, but that's a much larger discussion of uh, how this is taking place at this point in time, at least in India. Thank you for that question, Riel. Um, and thank you for that answer, Almar. Um, the next question I'm going to read on Himali's behalf. Um, Amar Himali wonders, uh, India has been using poetry, the Ramayan, to justify its own crimes. To what extent does poetry function not only as evidence of injustice, but as the motivation for violence itself? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, even the Gita uh, gives you a justification for violence. Uh, so, uh, and morally right violence and immoral violence and so on and so forth. And, uh, this is also, I mean, uh, we, are, we can discuss the United Nations resolutions and uh, armed resistance and justified resistance and uh, unjustified resistance and so on and so forth even today. Uh, so we are actually debating and discussing exactly the same thing. Uh, and also there is no single Ramayan. So, mm. uh, and uh, they are very uh, dramatically different Ramayan. So, uh, Yes, uh, 
it is uh, i would just simply say that this is a uh, we have to find different ways of speaking so that we find different ways of understanding and it's not that uh, i mean just to I mean, the kind of brutality and violence that i think that we are seeing and perhaps for the first time seeing live and in our pockets and phones and screens uh, around the clock. It's a completely different experience for the human species to experience this kind of um, uh, violence and also uh, in very different parts of the world. So you could probably be connected to violence that is taking place in your region, but to to wake up in the morning and see violence in Peru, uh, in Palestine, and in, in, uh, you know, in many other parts at the same time, as well as in it's another it's another state of being and state of existence for us, no doubt. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, looking, trying to understand it, uh, it is quite clear that very severe forms of violence and brutality did take place. 100 years ago, and 200, and 500, and 1,000, and so on, years back. And then when you look back, at least when I try to look back, I find, uh, I found actually a very a sophisticated form of understanding of this violence. And a sophisticated form of uh, uh, understanding of how to relate and respond to this violence mm. uh, in many traditions. Uh, and how to understand this this desire for violence or this this uh, con uh, continual uh, need and justification and so on for violence and uh, and there were many traditions uh, uh, that offered uh, very nuanced and highly analyzed and thoughtful and poetic and many other ways and theoretical understandings of of how to deal and respond to it and I think that. Um, you know, those also, uh, they are, they are useful. They, they show the way it's not, we have not been confronted with our brutality for the first time. Thank you, Amar. Um, we have two more questions if you'll have them. The next one is from GE. GE, I'll give you the chance to unmute to ask. Thank you so much, Chloe. And thank you. So much uncertainty, so much darkness, but then there's some light here too, I think. So this is wonderful, thank you. Can, can we say that your project is, is a meditation upon external reality rather than the representation of external reality or an uncertain attempt to be external reality? Uh, no, I think maybe if I have to if I'm forced to describe it, I would probably say that it is uh, it is probably becoming uh, a meditations on a meditation on our inner selves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, GE. Um, Amar, I'm going to ask the last question today. Um, on reading studies into darkness, um, you tell a story in your chapter in the book about a tarmac road in rural India um, and sort of the presumed explanations of the road um, mm -hmm. that it was assumed to maybe connect markets or to be an error. And then later you find out that the road is supporting industrial mining over a period of 10 years and that the people living around it are only now facing the consequences of its creation. Um, and it made me think a lot about, I mean, it made me reflect on a lot of the things that you've been talking about today, but it made me think a lot about darkness and its relationship to slowness, both in a good way and, and in violent way. And I wondered how you think about slowness relative to the project of darkness. Oh, I think it's essential, actually, uh, because it, I mean, I I think even before we speak, it felt like it was 
essential to be able to look in a certain way before we even spoke in a certain way. And then how do you find a certain way to look and it, you need it to be still, at least, to be able to look in a certain way. And, uh, you know, how do you be, how can you be still? And when you are still, what is it that you see? Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, I found that if I was able to look, uh, if I were to be able to slow down and stop, uh, uh, I could look in a way that I could uh, probably find uh, many relationships that otherwise I would not see. Uh, many relationships between many uh, beings and non-beings and things and and so on. And it's it's actually uh, this. Um, at least for me, I felt that this the slower I got. Uh, uh, the closer I was able to see these interconnections. And if I was able to sense these interconnections, it's actually in that interconnection, at least as a, as a storyteller, I felt I could tell any story. Uh, all stories made sense. Anything could go anywhere. Everything could speak to everything. Uh, it fell into place uh, if I slowed down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to you and to Ratan for this just incredible dialogue today. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for your very beautiful questions um, today. Um, we'd also, of course, like to thank our collaborators at the Virla Center for Art and Politics, especially Rail Christian, Ariel Lapira, and Karen Quoney. Um, and we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor this program, the NSC, and make daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our archive, where you'll be able to view this video later today. The rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our work. Um, we'll post a link to support our work in the chat. Um, and I encourage you to save the date for two additional conversations taking place as a part of this series in collaboration with Fearless Center for Art and Politics on March 14th and April 4th. We'll be announcing the details of those conversations in the coming weeks. And more immediately, if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with artist and actor Sasha Yeno and real contributor Ksenia M. Sobaliva on the occasion of Yeno's performance, Uncle, at the Kitchen in New York, which opens this evening. And um, now, uh, without further ado, uh, a real tradition we will proceed with, which is uh, the crescendo. Uh, so I'll give you all a moment to say hello and goodbye as you leave and unmute yourselves. And thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank, you Thank, so you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everybody. So grateful.